Amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, family. Singing was enriching and uplifting this morning. I appreciate that. I particularly enjoy that we have created an environment where men can come up here and look at a piece of scripture and say, this is long, but let's read it. Let's just read it. Isn't that a great choice? I've been a lot of places that have told song leaders and told other people, just do your job. Don't say anything else. Just, and it's, the Lord wants our hearts. The Lord wants us to be real. And, and I, I always ask the men who come up to lead, lead with the heart. Lead with your heart. And it's such a joy to be able to... Uh, where we can indeed uh, rejoice together and be real together. So who is your Lord? Who is Lord? Who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. You say that with me? Jesus is Lord. Now, for those of you who mean it, could you say, Jesus is my Lord with me? Jesus is my Lord. Amen. What a great statement. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, I don't even examine myself. He said, I'm conscious of nothing particular against myself. But in this case, that doesn't leave me innocent. Or at that level... I'm not acquitted. Corinthians 4, he's talking about the, those who are stewards of the word. He calls it of the mysteries of God. Stewards of those whose responsibility it is to teach. Required of stewards that they Trust. He says to the church, I'm not asking for you to examine me. I don't even examine myself. It's up to Christ to determine if I'm properly handling his word or not. Don't pass judgment. Wait until the Lord comes, he says. God, he will reveal all things. What I want you to do, look down at verse 6. But these things, brethren, I have myself and Apollos, and I want you to do this too, that you not exceed what is written, that you may learn not to exceed what is written. How do we know we're good stewards of God's word? How do we know who are careful and are, and are particularly taking care of that magnificent thing that God has given to us? Randy read to us the beautiful Psalm uh, 104, all about the, the greatness of God's creation, all about how wonderful it is, what God has done, that every animal out there is cared for by him through the seasons. Every, every spring, every valley, every mountain is a gift from God to us, and we are stewards of that. How foolish are we if we misuse it, abuse it, take it for granted, and don't enjoy it. But he says, there's something else I've given to you besides your life and your love. I've given you my word, my word, and I ask you not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Who's superior? Who knows? Which of us is so smart that we can correct God's word or that we can say, you know what, I'm not going to follow that part. I'm going to come to my own conclusions and not listen to God in his word. One of the elders asked me this past week, 
I wonder if people wonder why we're so picky about things. Why are we so picky about things? Why does it matter that we get together in an orderly way on the first day of the week? Why does it matter that we're careful to take the Lord's Supper and focus on that specifically? Isn't that just, can we just do things optionally whether we want to or not? Why does it matter that we don't add things to the uh, performance or to the uh, pattern of the church? Because we're told repeatedly in the word, you've been given something precious. You're caretakers of it. You're trustees of this. Don't go beyond what's written. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to make the judgments, uh, even with that clear teaching. Look at Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30, would you please? And before we read that, let's go to our Father in prayer for this lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we indeed need you to guide our hearts and our lives. What a joy it is that we've been given your word. We have so many copies of it, Father. It sits around our house. It sits around this building. It's in the back seats of our cars. It's, in our, it's even in our telephones, Father. It's in our computers. Father, your word is all over the place, and yet still we manage to not listen to it we still manage to not read it. We still manage to not follow it. Father, help us to be careful trustees of this beautiful gift you've given to us. Help us to be humble before it. Indeed, Father, you are awesome, and we trust you completely. Help us in this lesson to learn more of your word as we should. In Jesus' name. Amen. You caught in, in the way Paul d discussed first, uh, his handling of the, of the word in 1 uh, Corinthians 4 that he didn't get to choose what to do with God's word. He was given it and was taught what to do with it and was simply responsible for teaching it and following it. He presents himself very humbly through that. I'm telling myself and Apollos the same things I'm telling you. This, this very humble approach to God's word, and that's really the key to being a, a good student of the word, that we are humble before it. But I got to think that Proverbs 30 sort of hits a new a new status of humility. Proverbs 30, verse 2, starts out, Surely I am more stupid than any man. Now, I know you probably wanted preachers to say that to you. I know some of you. <clears throat> Surely I am more stupid than any man. I have felt that way in my own life repeatedly. I am more stupid. How could I be so stupid? <clears throat> Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. The, the writer is establishing the, the limitation of his own knowledge. How, how ignorant can I be? I only know this tiny little slice of time. I only know this tiny little slice of, of place. I only know this tiny little slice of life. What do I know about anything? Have I gone into heaven and come back? No. Have I... Control the wind even for a millisecond? No. Can I control the waters or pick them up? No. 
Do I know where the end of the earth is? No. And then he says, verse 5, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved to be a liar. This man has humbly, and I think it's a balanced bit of humility. He's not being ridiculous about uh, picking on himself. He has a, a healthy vision of his own limitations, but he has a magnificent vision of God's word. Every word of God is tested. And I want you to know today that every word in God's word is trustworthy. You can believe every one of them. Every word is true. Every verse is true. Every word that God sent through his Holy Spirit, written down by authors he chose, every word is true and to be trusted. You can, you can be confident of it. My favorite word, right? You can be confident, confident faith, confident in his word. As Paul tells the church in Corinthians, don't go beyond what's written. What's written is what we need. What's written is trustworthy. You go beyond what is written and you'll make a mess of things, so says the writer in Proverbs verse 30, chapter 30. Of course, we know in 2 Timothy 3, you can join me there, 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 1. We know, well, we're going to start in verse uh, of 16, which is the one, the verse you know very, very well. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every work. Don't miss the every. Don't miss the thoroughly equipped. Don't miss that this man is ready for everything he should be doing, all because of the word. Everything he needs is in his word. God's word, all of it, is God-inspired, God-breathed, God-taught, and sufficient for us to run our lives do everything we need to do. He wrote this in the context, and I'll go back to verse 1. In the last days, difficult times will come. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. We are in the last days. We're not in the last days because the world's about to end. We're not in the last days because Christ is about to come again. We're in the last days because we are in the last covenant given by God to man. That was established in A.D. 33, 35, whenever uh, uh, Christ ascended back into heaven, ever since he arose again from the dead. At that point, a new covenant was established. And these are the last days. It was just as much the last days when Paul wrote it to Timothy as it is to us. So don't get excited about the phrase last days. For men will be lovers, verse 2, Let men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, it sounds a lot like today. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. It would be easy, it would be so easy to point to this verse and say, yeah, look at all those people out there. Look at all those people who are disobedient to their parents and unloving and uncaring and, and ungodly and boastful and arrogant. But there's one phrase in this warning that ought all of us to stop looking outside and start looking inside. Because verse 5 says, these people have a form of godliness. They look like Christians. They sound like Christians. 
Where are they falling short? They may be falling short in faith. They're certainly falling short in sincerity. They're falling short in obedience. But don't let this message ever become across as, as, as we all need to be some kind of perfect person. I know God asks us to be perfect. But the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins continually. What he's really looking for is sincerity. What he's really looking for is faith. What he's really looking for is trust. What he's really looking for, for is for a people who want to dig into his word and follow it. We'll all make mistakes. So don't be driven away because it's some sort of impossible uh, a, a plateau or impossible goal to be perfect in Christ. God knows that. He knows that our feet are but clay, as we read in Psalms. But we need to be people who listen to his word and are humble before it. Always learning, these people are, verse 7, but never able to acknowledge, come to a knowledge of the truth. In that environment, Paul's telling Timothy, verse 14, you continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So we go back to this steward of the word, this, this caretaker of God's wonderful gift to us, and he says, Timothy, I'm putting you in the same position. You learned it from me I learned it from the Holy Spirit. You teach it to others. You be prepared. God's word, all of it is trustworthy. All scripture is inspired by God, verse 17. All of it is profitable. It's good for teaching. It's good for reproof. It's good for correction. It's good for training in righteousness. It's awesome. And then, of course, chapter 4, he says, preach the word. Preach the word. Stick with it. Trust it. This is essential to that claim of lordship we go. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Basic and fundamental to being in Christ is how we come to Christ. Lordship starts at the beginning. This idea of humility starts at the very beginning. Faith must be humble faith. I, I, one of my pet uh, theories, this is just my own brain cells, so don't look in Scripture for this, but one of my pet theories about baptism is, is that when you come up out of the water, you look really ridiculous. You, look, you don't look great. Your hair is all hanging down. you got water running off your face. You can't stand with pride before anything. You're just wrung out like a baby just born. I'm sorry, I've seen a few babies just born. They're not very attractive. They're gorgeous. They're awesome. They're fabulous. But they don't look very good. When you come up out of that water, you don't look very good, but you're awesome and you're gorgeous because you're new. Because you're new. That's just my own theory about the appearance and what, and what baptism does. And you can't baptize yourself. You ever think about that? You can't baptize yourself. You are to be baptized the, in the, uh, uh, the, what's it, the, the passive voice. You are baptized. Someone else baptizes you. You give up control to go into an environment where you can't breathe or live. You're only there a half a second or so or a second. But you can't survive in that environment. And so you submit yourself into somebody else's hands who brings you under the water and brings you back up into a place where God gives you real life. The first time this happened in Christ happened in the... In the uh, and the story is told in Acts chapter 2. And I know you know it well, but let's turn there, please. Acts chapter 2. So as, as Peter stands up with the crowd, the crowd thinks they've been drinking, and he says, we haven't been drinking. 
This is what the prophet Joel talked about. The effect you see in us is from the Holy Spirit of God as God pours out his spirit on all mankind. The spirit is available to everyone around the earth. That's what the coming of the Holy Spirit is, that all mankind has the same access to God's spirit. God no longer limits it to the individuals he chose as he did in the Old Testament. Now, the only limiting factor to God's Holy Spirit is our choice. You choose Christ, and in Christ you receive the Holy Spirit. So that's what he's talking about, and then talks about the kingship of David and how the throne of David has been reestablished by the Messiah. And oh, by the way, that Messiah is Jesus Christ, the one you saw and the one you just killed. So Acts 2, verse 36 Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both. What's that word? Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What would you do if you just realized that you'd participated in executing the Messiah? terror, a ripping remorse, somebody said to me here, and I, I think it's true about myself, he was talking about himself a few weeks ago, I'm sure glad I wasn't there to hear Jesus' teachings. That's a strange statement by a Christian, isn't it? I'm sure glad I wasn't there to hear Jesus' teachings because I'm such a stick-in-the-mud conservative, I would probably have agreed with the Pharisees that this guy is out of control, that this guy isn't being careful about his teachings. I probably would have sided with the crowds against this new teaching that sounds so different. I'm so glad God put me in this time frame and I can look back on it. And I said, I think I'm with you. I'm afraid I would have done the same. I'm not one who likes change very much. I'm not sure I would have accepted or listened very, with very much softness to Jesus' challenging, hard messages against the established people of God and God's temple. But in this crowd, thousands were pricked to the heart. Now when they heard this, verse 37, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. You know, nobody in the crowd raised their hands and said, hey, what about faith only? Isn't baptism a, a works? Nobody in the crowd said, I heard you could be, you could pray Jesus into your heart. Romans chapter 9 and 10 hadn't been written yet. And so nobody quoted any of the verses there as a contrary argument to what they were being taught. I have a video I want you to see. Uh, it's done by a man named Francis Chan. Now this part of a longer lesson and I edited it down. Some of you, when I say Francis Chan, go, I know Francis Chan. And some of you said, who? Francis Chan uh, is a very well-known author of, uh, of Christian-style uh, books. He started uh, a very large community church, non-denominational church, in Central California. He resigned from that position uh, because it wasn't, uh, I don't know, too big, whatever. And then he went, and now I, the last I've heard what he's doing is he's working in San Francisco, uh, church planting in inner city 
uh, for inner city people struggling. Francis, just a little bit of background, his mother died at his birth. His father remarried and his stepmother died when he was not in a car accident. His father died when he was 12. That's a pretty rough go of it as a young man. He's a very successful businessman, takes no money for his teaching, and he gives away a lot of his money. But he's written dozens of books, and you've probably heard of some of them. I know some of you own some of them and listen and read those. But this is part of his lesson. He started out as a faith-only style preacher. And in this video, he's, he gets to talking about this very verse we've been reading, Acts 2, verse 38. So this is a man who's made a change in his approach to Scripture. Can you start the video, please? When I preach on Acts 2, 38, uh, where the passage says, Repent and be baptized, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've had all sorts of emails and phone calls and letters asking, Okay, well, it sounded like you were saying I have to repent and then be baptized and then receive the Holy Spirit. And then other people were asking, Well, can I be a Christian without being baptized. Others are saying, can I be a Christian without repenting? Can I be a Christian without the Holy Spirit? And when does the Holy Spirit actually come in? If I just repent and do I get the Holy Spirit right then without being baptized? And all these questions came in and I, I want to answer them all with a question back at you. Why do you ask? Because they didn't ask. They, they asked one question. When they heard the message, when they heard the gospel message, when they heard that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that he paid the penalty for their sins, he heard that he was buried and he rose from the grave, they asked a different question. They asked, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Peter's response was, well, you need to repent be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? They didn't ask any questions after that. What they did was they repented, got baptized, and were filled with the Holy Spirit. I know, it's a crazy response, isn't it? They just did it. But we would rather ask a bunch of questions, and we would rather philosophize and speculate and go, well, yeah, but technically, can't you really? I mean, did they really have to get baptized? They just did it. And what's crazy to me is that we have gotten so off track in America and the way we talk about the Bible that nowadays people say you can be a Christian without repenting, being baptized, or having the Holy Spirit. I mean, how many gospel presentations do you hear where people say, well, just walk down an aisle, pray a prayer, receive Jesus. Okay, where do you see that in the Bible, though? I mean, I did it. I did it as a kid because that's what I was told. And I was in the system and I felt just absolutely fine with it until I started reading the scriptures. And then never sat well with me. Where does it talk about this prayer for receiving? I see repentance. I see baptism, I see the Holy Spirit, but, but what, where, where, where are we getting this? And the longer I'm a believer, the more I'm going, wait, I, am I going crazy here? Or are we missing the obvious? Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was simultaneous to them. You know, when, when Paul wrote to the, to the Romans, he just says, you know, don't you understand when you were, ba when you were baptized, when, you, not if, when you were baptized? It was just an assumed thing. A Christian was baptized. You, you go to Acts chapter 8, Philip's talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. He explains everything to him. And he goes, well, shouldn't I get baptized? He goes, yeah, let's stop the chariot and go down to a body of water. They, they didn't wait until they proved themselves. They just went and did it. Why don't we just... Do it the way they did it. Why don't we just preach it together? Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Where did this whole walking the aisle 
you know, thing come from? Where did this, you know, just slip up your hand and pray a prayer with me thing come from? I mean, do you see it? If you see it somewhere in Scripture, show it to me. Because I, I haven't seen it. I haven't found it yet. I'm just saying, well, let's do what the Bible obviously says to do. Let's go back to the early church. The church in its purest form. Christ just ascended. And here the church is starting. And that's what they did. And it was just the assumed thing to do. And let's just obey. You see, if you stay humble before the Word, the Word can always teach you. I'm not advocating uh, Mr. Chan's, all of his ideas, all of his doctrines. I don't know his doctrines. I've read some of his books and, and, and heard some of his teachings. So I'm not advocating him or his teachings. I'm just saying, even in his environment, in, in the evangelical movement of, the, of, of faith, if you stay soft to the word, the word can change you. Be humble before God's word. You know that part that he, he was referring to Romans chapter 6 when he said when you were baptized. He actually misquoted things just a bit. Some very, he would have had much easier time explaining it to people if he had con- finished uh, the verse in Acts 2.38. Um, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. When are your sins forgiven? When you're baptized. Can you be a Christian without your sins being forgiven? No, that's the whole point, I think. So it, he's exactly right. It all happens simultaneously. Repent, you're baptized, your sins are forgiven. You're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know you have the Holy Spirit in you. Do you have to ask for it after baptism? Do you have to feel it? How do you know you have God's Spirit in you? Because it says so. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to sense it. You have to thank God for it. His word says you receive his spirit. Do you believe him? Amen. Anyway, Romans 6, the part he was referring to. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, as we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. A couple of really critical things happen right there in Romans 6. Obviously, all your sins are forgiven when you're baptized, because that's what we read in Acts 2. But you end up mimicking the very death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, so that when you come out of that water, you're resurrected spiritually. You died. You died. You died to yourself, Christ is Lord. You died to your sins, he runs your life, not you. And you walk in newness of life. I appreciate the courage it must have taken Mr. Chan to stand up in those kind of communities and make that kind of proclamation. Yes, a Christian is baptized into Christ. It's what the New Testament teaches, and it teaches it over and over again. You can be confident. I want you to be confident that this is God's word and that you can follow it carefully and correctly and courageously, always humbly. And we can always be his people, his church. If any are ready this morning to be baptized into Christ, we stand ready. Uh, The water is ready. We're ready. Whatever you need, uh, come and let us know while we stand and sing the song that's been selected.